There are some days in the crypto market when uh, things like seems like nothing goes right. There's a lot of issues that come up and there's a lot of uh, negativity and there's a lot of FUD. But there's some days like today, which are actually quite positive. And there was this piece, this article that came up to talk about Walmart and virtual commerce. Now, this just came out uh, today, September 19th. And I didn't really think too much of it, except it was all about what the article was referencing. So this is right from Walmart and their news pieces, their blog posts. And they talk about the potential of virtual commerce. What they're talking about is the metaverse and things that are moving. Not just metaverse, like you're getting in there and you're playing games and being goofy and stupid. Like things that I can actually do in here and actually, actually have some kind of purpose and function. And when I read this, I'm like, it, it just makes me, makes me quite uh, bullish on the sector. But of course, we've got a long way to go. So here's what's happening. And the first, the first thing that I want to talk about, and the most important part is here, Citibank. And it states, Citibank estimates that the total market for metaverse-related commercial activity will be between $8 trillion and $13 trillion by 2030. Let me say that one more time. By 2030, between 8 trillion and 13 trillion in the metaverse related industries. With total metaverse users numbering around 5 billion. So right now we've got, we've got roughly 8 billion people. I don't know if that's gonna be that many people in 2030 if we actually connect all those people, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Let's just go on the low end. When we get half of the, of the population in the metaverse, 8 trillion to 13 trillion. And the rest of the article does not talk about blockchain, digital assets or anything like that. Nothing. There's no, no mention whatsoever about that in this entire article. So why am I talking about it? Just because it's metaverse. Because it comes down to this. What they are referencing is this Citibank PDF, this document, where they took a deep dive into it and what they said in here. Because again, they are referencing this document as far as metaverse. And metaverse plays in what they plan to do to generate revenue. So in the very, very beginning, interest in the virtual world, metaverse spiked in 2021, following a rise in the sales of NFTs. Interoperability and seamless exchange between, between underlying blockchain technology are critical to ensure a frictionless user experience. Different forms of cryptocurrency are expected to dominate, but given the multi-chain trend of the crypto ecosystem, crypto will likely coexist with fiat CBDCs and stable coins. So again, in this article, in this blog post, there's nothing about blockchain, there's nothing about digital assets, nothing about NFTs. But you can see where they reference things. They can, you can see where things are going, moving in this direction. And you can see as far as like seamless interoperability and the exchange between value. And it's not gonna be just on a fiat system, on a MasterCard and a Visa system. It's going to be used in a blockchain tech. And that's where this comes into. And what they're planning to do makes a lot of sense. And they state over the next year, you'll see us use a, a test of a variety of experiences in virtual worlds that connect to commerce at stores and vice versa. In fact, we've already begun. We initially started with the ability for players to virtually test certain glidden paint colors sold at Walmart. If you go to Walmart, just like Home Depot and Lowe's or something like that, they got a bunch, they, they got a whole section there for paint. You can go there and check out the paint and go, okay, this is going to look good in my house or this is going to look bad in the house or whatever they want to do, right? But within the app itself, they're going to say, look, you can go through the app, test out these colors, look through it on a virtual house, housing status, and then just pick your one and then come in and pick it up or maybe have it delivered. So doing this generated more than 12 million impressions for the Glidden brand over the first six months. 12 million impressions. I'm sure Glidden's pretty happy about that using in a virtual world. Again, how easy would that be as far as payments? Now you can use payments, you can use Visa, MasterCard, those types of things, but there are transaction fees. I think that's why in certain instances, that's why crypto and digital assets could actually be a little bit more of a boon for that. And not using Bitcoin and Ethereum, come on, let's be, let's be honest. We can't, we can't use those for, for transaction fees, it's too much. That's something around the lines of like an L2 or a Salon or something like that, hey, maybe. We'll get to Salon in a second. 
This month, we'll introduce the ability to purchase physical items contextually and natively in the game, either the same ones you use to decorate your house or ones you discover while playing, using your Walmart account without leaving the virtual world itself. And it sums it up perfectly right here. With the projected 3 billion participants spanning all geographies and demographics, virtual worlds and games represent the fastest growing category of entertainment. And they present us with the opportunity to redesign the shopping experience and invent the future of retail. The opportunity to redesign the shopping experience and invent the future of retail. Do you know how bad Walmart and the family that controls Walmart would like to overtake a little company called Amazon? Now they got the, their teeth kicked in essentially by them as they dominate online sales. This would be one of those ways, I think. And then on top of that, to be able to use these things and, and actually have digital asset ownership, there was a, I did an interview re recently with Hustlepedia and uh, he's co-host over there on Crypto Banter and uh, got a really good Twitter site. And uh, we went over a couple of things yesterday. I'm gonna release this uh, tomorrow, but it's the same thing that he talked about as far as digital asset ownership and actually being able to move things across different levels and different playing fields, not just in games, but in these, in these verses. And the thing that he talked about too on there was not about the specifics of any specific project, but the way that in which he invested in the picks and shovels of Web3 and blockchain gaming, and essentially metaverse in that respect. And he gave me three examples, so I'll release that tomorrow. But the thing that he talked about made a heck of a lot of sense. And I can see how that would all tie into what Citibank says and what Walmart said and how they're moving forward. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. It's amazing how some days nothing happens and all of a sudden we get stuff like this. But then not everything's great. Solana. So to be transparent, uh, I own Solana. And actually, I'm super biased in this channel. I don't talk about it unless I own it. Or unless I'm thinking about owning it, that's for sure. But uh, this was a, a good, pretty good piece by The Block. They said Solana's decline in active addresses is only part of the story. And they go through a lot of things. It's very interesting. But the whole thing comes down to this, active addresses. This is if you do some type of on-chain transaction. And if we see more of these on-chain transactions, these active addresses, and those numbers go up, then that means there's a form of adoption going on. People are actually using it. And we can see that as of today, it's at an all-time low. 195, 193,000 active addresses, somewhere around there. This is even lower than when it first kicked off, <laughs> all the way back in 2020. <laughs> Excuse me, 357,000, 400,000, somewhere around there. So what's going on? Because Solana was the next big thing. And was not Solana just picked by Visa to be able to use and transact in stable coins across their network? Visa, as far as payments go. What happened to these active addresses? I believe there was also a partnership between Shopify, that's what it was. But yet we see active addresses going down. So what's going on? Before, before all the haters of Solana start piping off and going, that's right. Or, for, or if, you, if you love Solana and start shouting out that at the screen, that's wrong. Let's just look at what we have. So these are the active addresses. And they say, well, look, there's a lot of bots using it. Maybe, the, maybe there's less bots using the network. Could explain the drop. I got to tell you, that's not a really good look for you if you're saying, well, the only reason we, we dropped is because all the bots stopped using, stopped using the chain. That's not something positive to talk about. And it just comes down here and it says, look, the problem with using daily active addresses as a metric is that it can be easily manipulated or influenced by short-term events. That's true. A more meaningfully metric, a more meaningful metric is transaction fees, which directly reflects the amount of money users are willing to pay 
in order to use block space or a, on a particular chain. And I have to tell you, so even though that we're down here, as far as daily active addresses, 195,000, somewhere around there, something like that. And, oops. Yeah, this one. So we got 197,000. Jeez, 197,000 active addresses going across there. But if we take a look here, this is from into the block. I don't have a, a link to it, but uh, app that in the block. If you see it, take a look at daily active addresses as far as Bitcoin goes. Bitcoin for daily active addresses, 1.03 million. It's quite a bit. Ethereum, 450,000. Tether, 81, 22. Cardano, no data. Dogecoin, 44,000. Look at uh, Toncoin, somehow makes it in the top 10. 249. What does that tell you? Oh, and if you're interested in, in uh, getting into Toncoin, just know that uh, 50 wallets control 85%. 50 wallets control 85% of all the circulating supply. So good luck with that. Uh, Polygon, active addresses, 1,000. Litecoin, 214,000. So I know people will say, well, Litecoin's a dead coin. Well, it's actually been something used. Bitcoin Cash, 112,000. So even though Solana is pretty low, I mean, it's right up there as far as daily active addresses. And then the, the last thing I would say is the fees. Because that's what the article talked about. It said, look, these fees, this is what really matters. But if you really think about it, as far as like the fees for transactions, isn't, do we really want high fees? I mean, it's great if you're, if you're a part of that project and you're getting that revenue, but as far as like, isn't that the whole point? to get the fees down lower? Do we really want to have these, these tremendously high Ethereum gas fees and uh, use it in that sense? I don't think we do. I think we want low fees. That will be great. But, uh, but regardless, you can kind of see as far as like adoption, how things are going. There's a great website, DeFi Llama. If we take a look at Ethereum, the fees over the last 24 hours, 3.6 million. Does that mean a lot of people are using it? Well, yes. But it also means that a lot of people are paying a lot in high fees. Lido, Bitcoin, you know, as much as people talk about Bitcoin, it's actually a third of the fees as far as Ethereum. Ethereum fees sometimes are just out of control. Tron, go figure, 1.2 million. As I understand it from people who, when I went to Korea, told me, the reason why people love Tron so much is because of the stable coins that are on it. Because if you want to interact in crypto, especially in the Southeast Asia region, you're going to want to use a stable coin that's based on Tron. Friend Tech, okay, sure. Open C Base, eighty-one thousand dollars. Curve Finance Compound Optimism, sixty-one thousand. Base Radiant, and here's Solana, forty-five thousand dollars. I got to tell you, in all honesty, I don't want to pay super high fees. That's the whole point of crypto, I think. Arbitrum convex. So if we really want to take a look at this and really say, okay, well, let's just compare apples to apples, orange to oranges. If we're talking about the actual fees that are going on, let's just click on Solana and see what the fees have been over time, over a continuum. And we can see that back all the way back in, again, Solana came out 2021, the fees weren't that much. No one was really using it. But if we can see here that there was a huge spike around the same time that it hit its all-time high around November 2021. Revenue fees was 304,000. Still, that's pretty low. What you really want to take a look at is over time how things are doing. And you can see it's pretty flat. Revenue here over the last, gosh, July, August, September, it's been about the same as far as fees. So if we can extrapolate that data, so even though we have this story and daily active users and it's awful, really take a look at it about 
really what's going on as far as adoption, how things are going, and some other data just take a look at and say, well, this isn't too bad. Now, for all the people who love or hate Solana, I'll let you sound off in the comment section. I couldn't care less. It's just an investment. Uh, but for me, I think Solana is just doing okay. And then lastly, Gary. Gary Gensler's got a problem. And the problem is, is that he's overcompensating for all the different things that they missed. And because of that, this is the guy that apparently is going to approve a Bitcoin ETF. I don't see it happening, but I mean, maybe. Everybody disagrees with me. So I hope I'm wrong. But here we go again. SEC's crypto enforcement chief warns that more charges are coming to exchanges in DeFi. So this is from Hirsch. He's uh, responsible for the crypto assets and cyber unit for the SEC. He says, look, we're going to continue to bring charges. He said the regulator has a number of other businesses on its radar that are operating in similar ways to Coinbase and Binance. Hirsch said the SEC's interest in crypto goes well beyond the high profile exchanges. We're gonna to continue to be active as the intermediaries, brokers, dealers, exchanges, clearing agencies, or any other agencies who are active in the space are within our jurisdiction and not meeting their obligations, either through registration or failure to provide adequate or complete disclosures. Really what he's saying is this, uh, we're not gonna give you clear guidance because that's not our job. And actually it is their job, but they're not gonna do it. And because of that, they're gonna allow these exchanges, these brokers, dealers, these clearing agencies to languish until they can sue the pants off them and try to get them out of here. That's really what it comes down to. And again, this is the guy that's gonna approve a Bitcoin ETF. Okay. Uh, to finish up, we're gonna to continue to conduct investigations. We're gonna be active in the space and adding the label DeFi is not gonna be something that's going to deter us from continuing our work, i.e. we're gonna start suing DeFi. The SEC has a finite enforcement budget that is often less than the financial giants it's used to facing, so its bandwidth is limited. We do have a lot of litigation going on. <laughs> and then he says some other stuff, and it is, it's irrelevant. So that's what we have as far as like the SEC. They're just, so, so just get ready. Just buckle in. I mean, we have good stories. We have bad stories. It's just, just everything's on a continuum. That's just how it is, and it's going to be rocky. And it's, it's something that I've said for quite some time, which is, look, if we wanna move forward, we have to have clear guidance on regulation. And I said this a long, I've said this for the last two years, I think. And it doesn't matter because no one believes me. I just think, ah, you're crazy. We don't need regulation to hell with the government. We'll do whatever we wanna do. Well, here you go. So you're still gonna need the government in some way for an on-ramp and an off-ramp, just how it goes. So hopefully we can get it done. The only way that we can get it done is if we stand up Bullies don't back down until you punch them in the face. That's really what it comes down to. And I said a long time ago, you got to start suing the SEC. Thankfully, Coinbase did that. And now they're going to launch a campaign. I think this is very smart to drive crypto legislation in the U.S. So this, and I link this in the description. I'd like you guys to do this if you're in the United States. Thanks. So Coinbase initiated a campaign encouraging crypto users to get in touch with their congressional representatives campaign will pay special attention to nine states, including Arizona, California, Georgia, Illinois, New Hampshire, Nevada, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. No Massachusetts in there. I don't know why. That's where Elizabeth Warren is. I think maybe they're just saying they're going to lose anyhow, so why even go there? I think that's one of the states they should actually go to. If you're going to have Elizabeth Warren popping off and, and getting her other nine senators in, in, in line with her, her legislation, I think we should... Uh, try to fight that, but who am I? So this will include in-person initiatives such as placing full-time field organizers. Coinbase states, they will explain how crypto is creating jobs and economic activity, just how important it is for the U.S. not to pursue an enforcement-only approaching that is driving jobs, innovation, and leadership out of the U.S. That's very true. Again, when I was in South Korea talking to people, they're like, oh, you're from America? Ah, we're sorry. It sucks for you but it's really good over here. And I'm like, I know it is. Each of these crypto public advocates has made the decision to stay in the US and use the underlying tech, the blockchain to update our financial system. 
Uh, Coinbase increased its crypto lobbying budget to nearly 3.4 million from 1.5. I think that's a mistake. I think they should have uh, done a heck of a lot more. As we can see, really what makes Congress goes round round is money. If he had Sam Bankman freed money, we probably would have, wouldn't have this issue right now. Coinbase sued the US SEC in April in an attempt to compel the securities watchdog offer regulatory clarity. The exchange is also facing, crypt, excuse me, Coinbase is facing, I should say, federal charges from the regulator accusing it of functioning as an unregistered securities exchange and failing to register its crypto staking as a service program. Again, Gary, protecting us harder. So what it comes down to is this. This is the call to action. And I didn't know this stuff. This was pretty good stats. Uh, gosh, what is there? 340 million, 360 million people in the US, somewhere around there. Somewhere around there, something like that. And 52 million Americans, <coughs> excuse me, own crypto. 52 million. Uh, and out of those 52 million, 75% have an income less than 100,000. 60% are Gen Z, 41% are minorities. 22% of Democrats, that's weird, 18% of Republicans, and 22% of independents. Okay, I got that. And this is what they want to do. They want to leverage the, the Coinbase platform to mobilize owners. They want to do a comprehensive paid media campaign across all the platforms in those nine states. And they will focus on these nine key states, blah, 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 blah. Arizona, California, Georgia. And it says you can do it a host of different ways, which would come down to this page right here. And you can do it in, in three ways. You can call, you can email, or you can tweet. I don't know about you, but I think calling somebody really probably does a better job. So let's do that right now. So when you're on this page, I'm just going to use my phone. Yeah. You click on that button, let's see, get started. And I'm not going to put my address in front of you, maniacs. Let's see. Join the fight. I'll put this in on my phone. Zip code. Email. Phone number. Two, da, da, da. Hold on. And check, check. Yeah. So again, you do it any way you want to. Because what it's going to do, it's going to route you. At least it's supposed to. to your congressperson. There we go. All right, yes. Uh-huh. And now it's gonna route me to my congressperson, I guess. TX. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Ooh, look at that. Uh, yeah, Veronica Escobar. Let's call her. All right. Hi, this is Congresswoman Veronica Escobar, representing the people of El Paso in Texas' 16th congressional district. You've reached my Washington, D.C. office. If you wish, please leave a message after the tone, including your name, address, and callback phone number so that we can return your call. Thank you so much for reaching out and have a wonderful day. Great. Hello, Office of Veronica Escobar. Uh, my name is Rob Wolf, and I am calling to request that there is some type of clear guidance as far as legislation for crypto and digital assets. Right now, it's uh, very difficult 
uh, for us to determine what is a security, what is a commodity, and what is a digital asset, especially as it pertains to people who want to invest into the crypto and digital asset space. So I'm urging you and your office to get together to uh, put forth proper legislation so we know exactly what to do moving forward so we don't have the same issue that is going on right now. Thank you so much. You have my phone number. That's it. That's all you got to do. So, uh, yeah. So that's all we have for today. So if you would be so kind and you're in the United States, uh, there's a link in the description. You can call somebody. You can email them. You can tweet at them. But you have to have your voice heard. <laughs> the reason why the same people are in the same office for all these years is because the people that uh, get up and vote uh, are the same people all the time. So it's up to you to do your job. And if you don't want to do it, it's okay, but you're going to get stuck with the ramifications of your inaction if you don't do anything. That's it for today. So thanks so much, everybody. I appreciate you stopping by. If you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. Now, if you want to stick around, we'll do a little Q&A and go from there. But uh, that is it. So uh, go from there. All right. Yes. So sorry about that beginning. I guess I didn't uh, wasn't shifting through my tabs correctly. Uh, but uh, there you go. And then uh, Duber has got a random question. Was NFA Live canceled? No.